The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to this webinar presented by the University Economic Development Association. My name is Tim Hines and I'm the Operations Director for UEDA and I will be serving as your MC for today's webinar. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, if you have a question, please use the questions feature in the right column in the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar panel. We'll have an opportunity to answer these questions at the end of our presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the UEDA website within the next week or so, so please stay tuned for that. Um, and with that, I want to get into uh, to the actual presentation. First, just a little bit about UEDA, since I know some of you on the call are not uh, necessarily familiar with the organization. Established in 1976, University Economic Development Association is North America's membership organization that brings together public and private higher education, private sector, public agencies, and community economic development stakeholders in economic development. UEDA's members work to expand economic opportunity and prosperity in our communities and regions by leveraging education, talent development, research and technology development, and community building and placemaking strategies. Our members include institutions of higher education, economic developers, and the for-profit sector, all of who are working for, uh, the improve, for improving the competitiveness of their individual regions. Now, through news and information, public policy, educational programming, and best practice sharing, UEDA works to expand economic opportunity in our communities by leveraging research, community and campus planning, talent development, and technology commercialization. The association is actually driving some new initiatives uh, that are pretty exciting, and I'd also like to share a few of those with you. Um, we launched a publication last year, Higher Education, Engagement, and Economic Development, Foundations for Strategy and Practice, which we call the Foundations. And it's about the roles of institutions of higher education and economic development and engagement with their constituencies. It was produced in support of higher education institutions by both the UEDA and the Association for Public Land Grant Universities, or APLU. And the foundation's publication is meant to inspire institutions to reinvent the relevant college or university for the 21st century, and to think more com comprehensively about how economic development and engagement activities connect to each other and to an institution's core mission. So I encourage you to check that out. You can check that out at foundations.universityeda.org. Now, in conjunction with this effort, we will also be launching a journal of economic development and higher education within the next few months. We've also invested in a new CRM system, which will help build a foundation for our online presence. And we have great ideas in store for that that include uh, member uh, engagement and drive collaboration amongst members. And lastly, we have a major effort underway to grow and diversify our membership base to further our mission to advance knowledge and practice and economic engagement by all institutions of higher education. So of course, for more information about UEDA, uh, as well as membership information, please visit our website, which is at the bottom of the screen and that's universityeda.org. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, introduce Fourth Economy and Jerry Paytas. Fourth Economy Consulting is a national economic development consulting firm specializing in market analytics, strategic planning, site selection, community assessments, and organizational building. Their team of experienced practitioners help build businesses, communities, and nonprofits, and they help them achieve their market potential. Now, the term fourth economy represents the convergence of the three previous economies, agrarian, industrial, and technological, and is defined by collaborative approaches to solving problems, growing markets, and attracting investment. Fourth economy believes the most effective and sustainable market strategies have to rely on how community, industry, and the environment converge and interact. The firm supports the growth of their clients and the, and the communities where they live and work. Fourth Economy's success is based on the approach that a sustainable future requires a deeper understanding of ways to collaborate across economic and social sectors. They build tools and consensus for collaboration across universities, businesses, communities, and innovation-based economic development. And we're lucky to have with us today, Dr. Jerry Paytas, who is Vice President of Research and Analytics at Fourth Economy Consulting. Jerry directs all research and analytic inquiry for the, for the firm, Jerry was the director of the Carnegie Mellon Center for Economic Development and has taught economic and community development at Carnegie Mellon's Heinz College at the Ben Franklin Technology Center of Western Pennsylvania. Jerry managed a network of service providers that assisted more than 1,300 clients, leveraged more than $280 million in loans and grants, started nearly 70 new firms, and created more than 1,000 new high-quality jobs. 
So with that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Jerry. And as I switch screens here, I uh, would also like to remind you that please use the, the panel uh, label questions to handle any questions you may have. Jerry? Thanks, Tim. It was my screen showing. Do you want to confirm that? I see your screen, yes. Okay, great. Thanks again, Tim, for the introduction. And uh, welcome to all of you out there. Uh, of course, a little bit odd not being able to see you all. I'm more used to doing these in person. Uh, but this will be uh, an interesting discussion, I hope. We're going to talk about uh, some of the big disruptive changes that are coming. The world right now, one of the things we know is it's constantly changing. The economy is growing more interconnected and dynamic. And this kind of disruptive change is not something that fits neatly into our economic equations or forecasting the future and trying to see what's going to be happening down the road. So now more than ever, past trends do not indicate future performance. And if we think about that brick wall, it looks very stable. And there's nothing about its prior experience that prepares it for the wrecking ball. That previous experience does not predict what the wrecking ball is going to do to it. So today we're going to discuss the big disruptions that are on the horizon that will impact our economy and your communities. As I said before, the tools of economics are built on stable and incremental change. The data and methods of economics tell us about the past. So even when we do it well, it helps us to predict the stable patterns. It does not predict the big disruptions, like the housing collapse of 2008. And it doesn't predict a 50-foot tall person or a flying pig. But those are the kind of changes that really challenge the established order. And we call that the flying pig blind spot. So those are some of the things we're going to talk about today. And in particular, we're going to talk about three areas of disruption. System disruption, environmental disruption, and cultural disruption, which will hopefully provoke some thinking and discussion around how these disruptions impact the relevant university and the domains of talent, innovation, and place. And that's something you can read more about in UEDA's Foundations for Strategy and Practice document. So first, let's talk about the disruption of systems. And we want to start with one of the major system disruptions. And you've probably heard about this under a variety of different names and labels, the maker movement or you may have heard of it referred to as artisan manufacturing. But where we're really seeing some fundamental changes here is around also new technologies like 3D printing, which is causing a fundamental disruption of the supply chain and a potential reordering of production systems. And then when we combine that with other technological changes like the Internet of Things, we get another cascading series of changes in the way we make and produce things in our economy. So when we really begin to see the fulfillment of the Internet of Things, when we have sensors everywhere and we're getting all kinds of data about everything, it not only changes the data collection and the analysis, and we're seeing this with big data and a lot of these other emerging disciplines and technologies, but this is also going to change how we might be doing work in the future where we get our schedules, how the planning is made around where to assign people and logistics are going to fundamentally change and be driven by this more dynamic and interconnected set of technologies and communication tools. So let's dive in a little more into you know, what I'm talking about in terms of the, the challenge to our production system. If we go back over time and think about we really first started manufacturing goods and producing goods. It was artisan style production. Production on a small scale where you had a producer working with a relatively small number of customers and everything was highly localized. The production, the supply chain, and the markets, they were all within you know, a very close distance, walking distance or a day's travel. 
in both design and production were really unified in that artisan or maybe one or two individuals. Then we moved to the system of mass production and assembly. Henry Ford, large scale production. You had a high ratio of customers for each producer. The distances exploded and stretched. Production occurred far from the markets. Everything was on a became on a more global basis. And we also separated design from the production and divided all the elements among many agents. Well now we're seeing a new synthesis, a reintegration of these elements. We can call that prosumer production, where the producer and the consumer are coming together in a new way, in some ways reminiscent of artisan production, and in some ways reminiscent of mass production. Now the production scales can flex. The ratio of customers for producers can vary. You may have a producer that it's providing a mass market and providing niche customers, or one that's only providing to niche or only to mass customers. Where production is occurring in the relationships to markets is still going to be on a global basis, but you can have producers located that are serving local markets and linked together through these technologies. So we're seeing now markets that can be both small and global. You may be serving a niche market that stretches across the globe or a very localized market. And the design and production are reintegrated, but now you can share those designs and reproduce them and customize them. And you can get mass production in that fashion. This is going to have significant impacts both on where materials come from, how they're sourced, the kinds of materials we'll be using, who does design, how the markets are ordered, and it also really fundamentally changes uh, a number of key industries that are currently involved in manufacturing and significantly impacts the way we're manufacturing now and the elements of design brought into manufacturing because we're able to design products and, and build them in a whole form as opposed to build them in parts that get disassembled and reassembled. And these are creating serious challenges both for how we organize production, logistics, materials, supply chains, and how we teach things like design. Then when we combine this with the Internet of Things, we really need to get smarter and faster. If you think about the regional economy today and what characterizes it and what drives it, so we've gone from the, most recently the centralized production system to where we now have a highly decentralized and globalized system. And I would argue that the critical features now are connectivity, flexibility, and interactivity. And implied in that is also speed. So our planning and management need to reflect those features. As communities, as regions, or universities, we need to adapt, reorganize, and respond quickly. We need connectivity to address the many problems that we face. Right now we have so many things organized in silos, be it an academic discipline, or be it how we do housing, workforce development, economic development, technology, all those are different silos. But the problems we face sit at the intersections of those silos, and it's the handoff and gaps between one silo and the next that create many of our problems, and that's where we need that connectivity. So we also need systems understanding. Are we training within silos, or are we teaching and creating the opportunity to learn about those intersections and the systems. We need to be both cross and multidisciplinary. We need this flexibility and interactivity and speed because the world is changing rapidly, so we need to adapt and do so quickly. We need scalable and dynamic planning and management. You still have to have a long-term vision that guides where you're going, but we need to balance that with a capability of rapidly deploying new technologies, or addressing the problems that arise. 
This also means that learning has to become more collaborative. We need to move from I know to we know so that we can get to we can. So now let's talk about disruption of the environment. So we're not talking about small scale disruptions in any of these areas, but we're building up as we go. <clears throat> Climate and energy is having a huge impact on our world. We are experiencing severe environmental disruptions in climate and weather systems. And if we look just in terms of constant dollars, so we're not being confused by uh, differences in how things are valued over time, eight of the top ten hurricanes in terms of economic losses have occurred since 2004. Six of the top ten wildfires have occurred since 2003. And overall, eight of the ten most costly climate-related catastrophes have occurred since 2001. We have a system that is out of balance. And where this is going to have a huge impact is in the availability of water and its impact on all of our production and most critically on energy. Tim, are we still doing the poll? Yep, yep I'll throw that up right now. Okay, so I want to ask you which of these companies you think has the largest revenue? So we have Duke Energy, Veolia, Sprint Wireless, and 3M. And while you're thinking about that, Is it, okay, there we go. Why are we talking about water? What is this intersection where these climate impacts are impacting water? Well, one of the things we know is water filters into everything we do as humans. It's essential in our daily lives. It's a part of the production of everything we eat or drink. Everything we manufacture requires water. Critically, without water, we have no energy. It's essential in the mass production of all of our energy, even in wind and solar, because you can't make the solar panels and you can't make the wind turbines without water, and often water is still involved in other aspects of producing energy from every single source. But then we also need energy to clean, store, and move water. It's a virtuous cycle, but also a vicious one and we don't have enough water of the right kinds of quality for the global demand that exists. Global demand for clean water has outstripped the supply. And by 2030, we'll only have enough water for 60% of global demand. As an economic driver, water will, is predicted to eclipse oil by a wide margin. Some estimates are that as a market, it'll be a thousand times bigger than oil by 2030. Right now, we're projecting a global market for water supply and treatment that'll grow from 485 billion to 770 billion and then continue on there to 2030. Most of what we do related to water is based on technology and processes from our grandparents, at least in the US, but a lot of it is not more sophisticated than what the Egyptians and the Romans invented. And we tend to think of water as free or as a right because it's such a basic human necessity, but it isn't free to treat, store, or move, and we can't make any more of it. So the economics are always about getting the right quality at the right place, price at the right time. So as the water demand is outstripped by the available supply, it's going to put a huge pinch in both our drinking water, the water we need for manufacturing, the water we need for agriculture, and the water we need for energy. And all of that is going to combine to create some serious impacts on the pricing of everything we make and do. And there's no substitute for water. Everyone has a smartphone, and I think most people think it's essential. 
You can't get by without it, and we use them all the time. We get into car accidents because of them. They're very useful, and we spend a lot of money on them. And if I mention a phone company brand, everyone will know it. But those smartphones aren't as valuable as water, and they're irreplaceable. There are substitutes for your phone. Email, letters, in person, we have many choices. But there is no substitute for water, and we die without it. We need to become a lot more aware about water. So Tim, do we have the results of our poll? You bet. I'll put them up right now. Really? Only 18% heard of Sprint Wireless? But I also note here that of all these companies, the largest one is Veolia. And 21% of you thought it was the largest, and you were right. About $46 billion in annual revenue. Next would be Sprint Wireless at $35 billion, and 3M at $32 billion. Veolia is perhaps the world's largest provider of water technology and solutions. And if you haven't got to know it yet, you probably will get to know it very soon. Now, a lot of people may be thinking, all this talk about water doesn't affect us. We live in the Midwest or the Northeast or the South. We get plenty of water. That's a problem for Texas or California or the Middle East. Well, unfortunately, what's happening in our climate is drought and heat are affecting water and energy everywhere. We've seen it in Connecticut. We've seen it in Illinois and other places in the Midwest and throughout uh, the Tennessee Valley area territory where drought and heat have made the water too warm to cool the equipment for nuclear power plants or to use in other power plants or they simply didn't have the, the, the drought had dried up the water and the water pipes ended up on the ground. Now you can run new pipes and go deeper and deeper uh, but at some point, all of that puts a severe pinch on our water and our energy. And we're typically looking at energy and thinking about energy from the perspective of either how much it costs. We may think about where it comes from. A lot of talk about energy independence. We had a little bit of policy attention paid to how much carbon dioxide is produced by each of these energy sources. But to date, there's been very little to no attention paid to how water efficient our fuel sources are. And so this graph shows us the water efficiency of the various fuel sources. And the larger bubbles represent those fuel sources that give you more energy per billion cubic meter of water used. Now this isn't a perfect presentation of it. Your non-conventional oils like your tar sands uh, show up as very inefficient. They also really pollute uh, the water that gets used. Whereas biomass, which is also inefficient, really doesn't do as much harm to the water supply as some of these other sources. But we need to start thinking about how water efficient our fuel sources are and how water efficient our production systems are in our built environment. So when we think about your region, your community, or your university, you know, the impacts will vary depending on the availability of water in your region, but also depending on what are the sources of energy for your region. What does your energy portfolio look like? So when you think about your regional energy portfolio and those sources of energy, you also need to think about, are you becoming more water efficient? And this isn't just for an environmental feel-good measure, but I posit this as a necessity for long-term economic sustainability. So how much capital expenditure in your region or on your campus is going to buildings and infrastructure that are water and energy efficient?
And last but not least, we're going to talk about disruptions of culture. We're seeing new power structures emerging around the world. The rise of the Asian powers combined with the ongoing struggles of the European Union, which is all tied into the migration that we're seeing happen, migration out of the Middle East, people looking for security, as well as new economic opportunity. All those migratory trends are continuing, along with some fundamental demographic shifts that are happening on a global scale. And whereas these other disruptions we talked about have either a cause or a solution related to technology, the cultural disruptions, there is no technology that's going to fix that. So let's look at what is happening in the rise of new powers. When you look across the advanced economies of the world, growth has been relatively stagnant. The emerging economies have demonstrated rapid growth. But now what we're seeing is China and India are pulling away from the rest of the emerging economies. The question for the future will be whether or not the rise of these two economies is sufficient to fuel global demand. And then if these are the growth markets, what regions are in position to trade with them? They've also been sources of enormous pools of talent for our universities and for the economy here in the U.S. And they have pools of talent that, that dwarf our own. And as their economies grow and advance, will we continue to be able to pull on that talent or will it be increasingly drawn to home? The other big shift is really the, the graying of the globe. Now, being from Pittsburgh, this has been a problem we've been concerned about for a long time in our region. Uh, but we've recently made the shift from being one of the older regions uh, to being a smaller but younger region. Across the rest of the U.S. and really across the 20 largest economies in the world, the working population is not going to be keeping pace with the senior population. So from 2015 forward, we will no longer have a working age population that is larger than the senior population, creating a much more dependent economy with far fewer people working. So in this environment, how do we sustain growth? And how does this change our economies? Are we going to get more productive? Are we going to raise the retirement age? These are going to be some fundamental challenges, and they're going to be dealt with in different ways in different, in different countries. In the U.S., we've seen the shifting demographics make it harder to both attract students. The number of students graduating from high school has essentially been flatlined. It's projected to continue flatlined. We've been able to grow enrollments only by gaining a greater market share of those graduates. But we found that we're lagging on literacy. And as we try to increase and expand that market share of getting more non-traditional students, it's going to become even harder to educate those students. And it's going to be harder for the U.S. to compete globally against the educated and skilled talent that's available in the rest of the world. And we also see that the aging of the population can also make it harder to get so political support for education funding. With tight budgets and with a rising number of college students, there's more pressure and demands on the education system. They're having to teach more students with fewer resources. 
and dipping into students that are even harder to teach. And then as we get more students from different backgrounds at different levels of preparation, and we're trying to develop new ways of teaching them that are more collaborative, that are multicultural, so that we can prepare them for this global economy that is multicultural and multilingual, the challenge gets even greater. So where does that leave us? What now? I don't want to put this all off as entirely doom and gloom. I fundamentally do believe that we can shape the market. And by we, I mean regions. The global economy is not some monolithic force that's omnipotent. You know, these are significant challenges. But regions are the engines of innovation and change, especially those regions with strong university partners that can bridge the gaps between talent development, innovation, and commercialization. Now, we've talked about some of the significant changes in the way we make and exchange goods and services, and we've talked about the environmental changes that are happening with climate and water. And we've also talked about a new cultural landscape that affects both the mission and the market. So as we look forward to how do we, what do we do about this, there's also a growing acknowledgement by the federal government of the role of regions and new programs that are organized around regions and clusters to provide more support for this kind of regional self-determination. The Office of Economic Adjustment has their Defense Industry Adjustment Grants. HUD has its Sustainable Communities Program. The EDA has their I-6 program. And now we have the National Network for Manufacturing Innovation, which is creating a new hybrid model of research and industry partnership grounded in regional clusters that combine the elements of a national lab with an MEP and a state innovation program. So while these global forces are not uniform, I think they're actually generated and shaped by strong regions. We did some research at Fourth Economy looking at regional cities that led their own transformations, that determined their own future and drew some lessons from them. We're all familiar with, you know, regions like Silicon Valley and the impact they've had. We took a look at another level, Austin, Raleigh, Durham, Denver, Nashville, and then other places like Fayetteville, Provo, Utah, and Boise, Idaho, to see how did they shape their destiny in the face of all these global forces? And what were the elements that helped them be successful and carve out a future for themselves that was better than what global forces may have determined for them? So one of our key findings was you did have to have that bold vision with combined with tenacious leadership and a broad civic infrastructure. And you needed to be regional. And one, this is about recognizing the core of your urban areas, but it's also about being in an even bigger region. So it's not just about Pittsburgh. We looked at Pittsburgh and Cleveland and the other parts of that region. How do you have a region that is big enough to compete on the global stage? And what is that core region? And you want to engage and strengthen industry in new ways. It's not just that they're funding research partnerships, and it's not just that you're providing incentives to them. Uh, you have to engage them around the quality of place, around the talent, uh, and around the innovation space. And then you need regional investments that support all of that. Making sure you have the housing making sure you have the recreational amenities and making sure that you have the research facilities, schools, and infrastructure that are all effective and working. You need to have that vision grounded in some market-based and action-oriented plans to guide that regional transformation. Those plans are going to be dynamic. They will change over time. They can't be static. Uh, but you need to make sure that people are organized and moving in 
a unified direction. The private sector investment is not just about the business climate, it's also about the talent base. So taxes are important, but it's not all about low taxes, it's also about what you get for those taxes. And you have a community that people want to live in and that is attractive to people and provides the kind of quality of life they want. We also found that each of these regions had financed this in new and creative ways, often with a multifaceted approach. There was no single silver bullet funding source they had, but they all assembled sources in unique ways to fund their strategies. Another common theme was that they had long-term partnerships that were nonpartisan. Now some of this goes back to is it just boosterism, but it's fundamentally not about Republican or Democrat, not about liberal or conservative, but about the region and about the community. And we also saw that higher education partners were critical for regional transformation. So I think within there is a recipe for how regions move forward in the face of these disruptions that if you don't plan and prepare for them, if you don't think about the potential impact, uh, you'll be fine as long as your brick wall is standing, uh, but when the wrecking ball finally does hit, you will be taken by surprise. So as you think about your community and your university, consider how these system disruptions around production, environment, and culture will impact the development of talent, the generation of innovation, and the vibrancy of our communities. So thank you, and we're open for questions. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. We do have a couple questions in, but uh, if you do have any other questions, please feel free to type them in the question block, and we'll get to them as we uh, as we can throughout. Um, the first question here is, uh, in your opinion, Jerry, is one disruption more critical than another? Um, I think the cultural disruptions are the toughest. Um, but that can depend on your particular uh, circumstances. If you're in a water poor region uh, that uh, doesn't have a good energy profile, um, that could be, you know, a, a very serious problem. Um, so I, I think there's some different regions will have different priorities for uh, for how these might impact. Uh, it can also be a big the uh, disruption of the production systems. You know, for a machine shop community. Uh, some of the types of manufacturing we still have here around Pittsburgh, um, you know, there's a potential to really disrupt a lot of our uh, manufacturing capacity here. Uh, whereas we have a diverse energy portfolio and relatively abundant water, uh, you know, that may not that may not be the primary thing that that we would be concerned about. I know that's kind of those are that's kind of a weasel answer, but uh, but I do think that the cultural disruptions are the toughest to solve. Well, and, and that kind of leads into another question. So, if, if regions truly are unique, how does a region determine which disruptions will be greater within their specific region? I, I mean, I think that's the process that the process of thinking that that the region has to go through and say, uh, how is our, you know, are we a place that, that makes things? Are we a manufacturing and, and production hub? Uh, 
if so, then you need to look at, at these types of, of things. Uh, you know, then you look at your regional energy portfolio. Where are we getting our energy? Uh, are you an and are you an energy producer or an energy uh, importer? And then, and then, what does that profile look like? And how water efficient are you? I think it's it's you know really just kind of going through that process of elimination. Do you have uh, you know in Pittsburgh we're projected to have uh, over the next decade 250,000 people retire from the workforce. Uh, we've got a workforce of about a million people, so that's a fairly significant chunk of people. Um, how are we going to replace that population? Uh, that's a pretty big uh, disruption for us. So, you know, it's really a process of going through and, you know, looking at some data, doing some critical thinking and analysis of your, your region and your situation, and then being able to identify, you know, what you think the, and, and there might be something, there might be a disruption you know, outside of the three that I've identified that's more important for your region. And, of, and then of course, let me guess, that's something that Fourth Economy all, always helps with, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we'd be happy to help with it. Absolutely. Uh, so another question, can you give us an example of prosumer production? I think if you... Uh, Probably the best example is to Google some of the uh, 3D printing. Um, so prosumer production would be uh, if I wanted to get a new pair of shoes um, or uh, whatever particular type, a lamp, uh, if I have a 3D printer, I can shop for that design and print it up at home. So I'm the consumer, but I'm also the, the producer. Gotcha. Um, how about some examples of funding strategies for responding to disruptions that you see as, or, or have seen in your, in your time as being innovative? Um, well, the most innovative funding strategy that I've seen is actually not one of the ones we saw in the regions we looked at for the Indiana study, um, but it was uh, the Kansas Economic Growth Act. And they created, uh, for the growth of the biosciences, they created a payroll-based TIF. So if you're familiar with development finance, a typical TIF, TIF stands for tax increment financing, is done around real estate development. And you draw a district around an area, uh, preferably it should be an area that's blighted or of uh, low property values. You draw that district and you cap the assessed values where they're at. Then when you make your investment in that area, you use that increment of value created from that investment to pay back your initial investment. Well, what they did with uh, biosciences in Kansas is they said, well, these are the industries in biosciences. Here's how much payroll we have in whatever year they started, 2004 or something. Uh, so we're going to, any of the payroll growth above this, we're going to take a portion of that and invest it back into the biosciences. And they did that for a number of years and were able to pull together $500 million to invest in the biosciences. And then use that to fund a lot of uh, new faculty at the universities to invest in uh, bioscience R&D and commercialization, uh, and then also to win some major federal research facilities for the state of Kansas. That's one of the most innovative economic development financing tools I've seen. Um, yeah, that, that's the most innovative one I've seen. Okay. Is it safe to say that we already know some of the major disruptive factors, 
but may struggle with traditions and an attitude of status quo? Or is the biggest concern going to come from something not yet known? Hmm. It's safe to say that we already know some of the major disruptive factors. Um, is the biggest concern going to come from something not yet known? Well, uh, you know, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. Um, I mean, we always struggle with tradition and an attitude of status quo. Uh, and generally, communities don't change in fundamental ways until they're absolutely forced to, until that disruptive change breaks the status quo, breaks the system, and then they're forced to change. Um, but there are communities that uh, and, and some of the some of these ones we've profiled here, but uh, you know, other communities that are becoming more proactive, um, and uh, you know, responding to future threats, uh, or not even threats, but even sometimes seizing future opportunities, because uh, what might be a uh, a negative disruptive influence for one region can be a positive disruptive influence for another. Um, and, that's, and that's exactly another question that we had. Could not disruption in one area be the solution in another? Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, if you look at the history of the of the steel industry, uh, the British took it from the Germans, Pittsburgh took it from the British, and then, you know, the South took it from Pittsburgh and then the Japanese, you know, took it from the U.S. I mean, it, you know, our decline was their growth. Uh, and so you have the development of industries uh, connected to the development of regions. And as one sort of wanes, another one waxes. Uh, maybe they have a different technology or a different approach. Uh, so, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, the status quo, it never stays that way for very long. Um, but exactly that kind of leapfrogging activity, uh, you know, is often how places grow. But the successful regions are able to either diversify or adapt. Uh, you know, they're able to, to lose one part of their economy, but, you know, grow another limb to replace it. Uh, I don't really know if I fully answered the uh, biggest concern going to come from something not yet known, but uh, I'm going to pander that off on that, yeah, that's not yet known. <laughs> okay. Now, do you see any difference between public and private institutions with respect to the degree or type of, of changes that they are facing? Um. Hmm. That so between public or private, uh, probably beyond basic funding, you know, yeah. situations is you know is it more regionally um, driven or is you know other aspects? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the public institutions are going to face um, well, they they both face different budget challenges. Um, and the public institutions have to be responsive to certain uh, public policy priorities. Um, so that's going to put a slightly different pressure on them, but then they will have often, you know, some public resources to help them with that. Um, so it may change. I don't think it changes the, the types of things they face, but it, it may impact the priorities that they would want to address. Uh, private institutions will have more uh, freedom to 
prioritize or choose differently. Okay. Uh, this one's a two-part question. This is in relation to the regional cities uh, box of nine that you had up on the screen. Um, so who within the, those regions that you listed are are sort of leading the charge uh, in the strategies? Is it universities, government, business sector, who? And then also, um, is that reaction out of forward-thinking leadership, or was there some sort of crisis, either real or perceived, that started sort of served as a catalyst to to drive that discussion and that that charge? Um, let me answer the last part first. Uh, there was not a uniform. You know, we did not find a crisis in all of them. We did find crises in some of them. Although in some cases, the, uh, there was a crisis that also came once they had that, uh, that collaborative group already in place, so they were able to adapt to it. Um, but we did not find, and I guess, you know, and this is a little surprise. I mean, we, did, we were sort of thinking there would, there would be a major precipitating uh, Element, but we found that in some in some cases and in others not, um, and that may also just be the fact that you know you never know how far back in time do you have to look to find these these things. Um, so you know there, there may have been a crisis, but we just we weren't able to wasn't apparent to us. Um, but in terms of you know who led, uh, there were different leaders in in each of the cases. Um, but what was common was more that that there was a table, um, that uh, that there was a more collaborative uh, regional leadership approach versus we have a designated lead agency. Um, so in in different communities, you might see a different. Uh, Emphasis between who was at the table, um, but they all had these various elements represented in some fashion, um, involving business, involving the universities, involving the public sector, uh, and, and all those were at the table. <coughs> so it truly does take a region. Um, uh, and this is uh, – I'll make this the last question uh, as we're approaching the end of our hour here. Uh, does a response to the issue of disruptive change have to be equally disruptive or innovative, or can it come through tearing down existing silos and be a large series of smaller actions that serve collectively to change patterns for the good? Okay. Well, I'm going to give Paul the award for most provocative question. <laughs> Because <laughs> um, that's the second uh, really good question he has posed. Um, does the response to the issue of disruptive change have to be equally disruptive? I, I think it can come. Um, well, I think tearing down silos is disruptive because that's going to disrupt the status quo. Um, but, I do, but I do think, I, I guess where I would say you say a large series of smaller actions that serve collectively to change patterns for the good. I mean, I, I think that if you can get enough of those chained together, um, you know, that can respond uh, to those big changes. Um, but it would, but it would take a lot of them, and I think uh, through that process, it will force the silos to adapt. Um, and it doesn't have to be disruptive if you can uh, build in sort of a process of communication and analysis in your, you know, management and administration. 
uh, whether that's within the university or within the government or within the various economic development groups and participating bodies. Um, you know, if you're able to have flexibility in figuring out what's the problem, who solves it, you know, how do we get it done, and and each of those issues that you tackle, some may require big changes, some may require smaller changes. Um, you know, we can look at, uh, uh, you know, completely revamping uh, our systems and uh, replanning our cities. Um, I, someone had, had mentioned to me that uh, actually with all the water supply problems, and I've never been able to verify this, like a small reduction in the consumption of meat would free up uh, an incredible amount of water that's currently, you know, going to uh, producing beef and other meat. Uh, you know, so that could be a small change in diet that radically impacts the availability of water. I've never been able to verify if that's true or not, but I think that's a good example of the kind of, you know, potentially small change uh, that can have a system-wide impact versus rebuilding your energy infrastructure or inventing new technology that's more water efficient. Sounds good. So, you know, to kind of put you on the spot, um, I'm sure some of these have provoked some some head scratching and thinking that, you know, may, can I say, perhaps lead to a, a blog piece in the in the coming weeks or months on the Fourth Economy blog? Uh, sure. <laughs> Jerry's a pretty active blogger on the on the Fourth Economy blog and, and pretty engaged in that, so I'm sure that uh, some of these topics will come up uh, come up down the line. So, um, you know, with that, I, I would like to to wrap up the webinar. Jerry, thanks for being with us today. Appreciate you and, and Fourth Economy being being here uh, with uh, University Economic Development Association. If anyone needs to get in contact with Jerry, uh, you can do so through the Fourth Economy website, which the web address is on the screen: www.fourtheconomy spelled out. Dot com. And uh, with that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up the webinar. Uh, I appreciate you all being with us today and look forward to our next conversation. Thanks. Thanks, Tim.